like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me again here. Um, and I'm gonna take a little bit a uh, different view. Um, all of you have been confronted with the fact that uh, people say you're not sick. So I'm gonna start with the basic laboratory work. And in medicine, we use standardized tests, blood tests, uh, biopsies, urine, stool tests, and sometimes saliva tests, and we still have more tests. So I'm not gonna be complete in, in this lecture because I don't have time for that, but I'm gonna show a few things uh, that in routine tests already could show that there's something wrong. So a lot of patients have a very low sedimentation rate. This is significant, um, and um, David Burke uh, in the United States has shown that one third of patients uh, has a coagulation over activity. And also there are uh, volume changes in, in, in this, uh, this uh, disorder. So a low sedimentation rate is not a normal thing. I mean, the sedimentation rate is usually only one or two millimeters per hour, and uh, that is in this case, is this is an abnormal. We see either anemia due to chronic inflammatory syndrome, a normal hematocrit, or elevated hematocrit, patients who have uh, also um, obstructive apneas or central apneas, uh, they get an elevated hematocrit, which doesn't help them if they also have a low blood volume. A lot of patients have mild eosinophilia, and I think uh, Judy will talk about that too, but eosinophils are also macrophages, and they are also involved in infections. A lot of patients have thrombocytosis, a mild thrombocytosis, so platelet activation, which doesn't help the circulation. CRP is usually normal. It's uh, usually below three, and, uh, but high sensitivity CRP is increased when you take normal value of zero. Uric acid is low, and we see that uh, uric acid can be very low in these patients, and we see that as a TH2 shift. I see in 70% of my patients where I measured it that copper and seroplasmin are increased. I mean, these patients do not have Wilson's disease because the seroplasmin is, is, is increased, but they have a gradual increase in copper load in the body. We have an explanation for that because normally the red blood cells are the major uh, take up, do the major take up of, of copper, and there seems to be something wrong with the take up of copper in red blood cells. ASTLT can be increased without gamma GT. And Increased ASTLT can also point out to immune activation. Gamma GT is often elevated, and uh, patients are often said that they drink alcohol, al although they don't tolerate alcohol, and uh, that's because of liver steatosis, because their fructose malabsorption, and fructose malabsorption causes to produce acetaldehyde, which is a toxic alcohol. In fact, some CFS patients are alcoholics because they make the alcohol themselves. <laughs> and then we have vitamin D3 and 125-dehydroxy uh, vitamin uh, uh, D. And you know there's an American who talks a lot about that, uh, uh, Dr. Marshall. Um, we see uh, an increase in 125-dehydroxy vitamin D in a lot of patients, and we see that also as a, a sign of inflammation, so enzymes that put vitamin D3 in the active form are also related to uh, inflammation. Alkaline phosphatases can be very low. The Der Buchwald has already showed, shown that in the past. Ferritin can be extremely low due to uh, associated gut disorders or can be very high, and some people have a latent hemochromatosis, which is a cause of CFS. I mean, we must not forget that uh, a few percent of uh, patients who present with a CFS-like syndrome really have an undiagnosed hemochromatosis. And it doesn't always go together with high hematocrit. Um, we have a lot of patients with low IgG3 and some also with IgG1 uh, deficiency, and that seems to be acquired. And also we have a lot of patients with abnormalities in the protein electrophoresis. I don't have time to go in all in, in detail, but there is an explanation for a lot of those things. 
When we look at the immunophenotyping, we see that the total number of lymphocytes uh, can be very low in these patients, can be half or less than, than, than half have patients with only 500 lymphocytes, where you usually have 900 to uh, over 1,000 lymphocytes in total. Altered CD4, CD8 ratio is, is not uncommon. With 3 to 5 percent of patients who have less than 510 per cubic millimeter CD4 T uh, lymphocytes, which is the cutoff point in, in our laboratory, and so I have patients running around with 250 to 300 CD4 T lymphocytes, where you would think they have AIDS. 20% have less than 230 per cubic millimeter and uh, with low CD8. So there are more patients with low CD8 than uh, with low CD4. The ratio in K cells uh, of the um, CD57 positive to the CD57 uh, um, uh, negative cells, uh, the CD3 negative to CD positive cells uh, can be altered. Also in the B cells, we see abnormalities, even uh, patients with high B cell numbers and patients with low B cell numbers, and um, we don't have any real data on activity. What is striking and is what we uh, presented uh, last year is that um, more than 90% of our patients have increased soluble CD14. And soluble CD14 codes for LPS in the serum. I presented two years ago here data on Norwegian patients with high LPS in their serum. Well, um, more than 90% of patients have high uh, CD14, and some have like three times normal values up to five times normal values. So the, this shows that there is uh, abnormal uh, transfection of bacteria from the gut to the blood. Majority of patients have low uh, CD57 positive lymphocytes, um, which also is a, a, a defect in the immunity. A subgroup of patients has high leukocyte elastase activity. And high uh, leukocyte elastase activity can happen when you smoke, but uh, here uh, most uh, ME patients are non-smokers, and uh, we still see a subgroup with high elastase activity. Then we have the fragmented uh, complement four. It's increased in more than 80% of the patients, and it shows that there is signs of chronic immune activation. And then there is the perforin uh, messenger RNA expression, uh, which can be low or high, uh, and that has to be looked at individually. Other things we find is that um, these patients cannot get rid of intracellular infections. And uh, more than Borrelia, we see people with chronic infections with Bartonella, and we saw op also patients with Coxiella and, and, and Rickettsia. Um, the most in Belgium, um, it's supposed to be 2 to 4% of people that could be infected in normal population with Bartonella. Well, it's higher than these normal uh, uh, expected numbers. We see a number of patients that are uh, exposed to molds in the house, Aspergillus niger, uh, Cladrosporium, and so on. Uh, other people are also exposed uh, to these, but for ME patients, this is uh, another mechanism of chronic immune activation, which could uh, lead to the pathophysiology uh, being uh, more de deregulated. About the cytokines, I'm sure uh, Judy's gonna talk more about cytokines and, and XMRV, so I, I didn't include that, but in our panel on, on uh, cytokines, we see there's a clear signature of XMRV, and uh, in our group, IL-8, MCP-1, and MIP-1-beta are uh, mostly increased, and these are chemokines uh, related to um, macrophages. Less are increased, IL-6, IL-10, and IL-12. TGF-beta can be increased or extremely low, and uh, as Nancy Climas has shown in the past, a subgroup of patients have increased alpha TNF. When we do a food intolerance panel, uh, we see sometimes uh, extreme uh, abnormalities. Um, people ha really have what we call leaky gut and have food intolerances for most uh, uh, foods when we test for 96 foods. But um, we can often see that in families, there is some genetic trait that people are intolerant to casein, and for gluten, that can be uh, genetic, but also acquired. 
we can make the difference by measuring tissue transglutaminase and lidin antibodies. Some patients, even if they're not from Mediterranean in or origin, have lactase gene uh, defects. Uh, we measure uh, now also XMRV and uh, XMRV serology, which we sent to the United States, and we've also uh, measured routinely the MLVs uh, as described by Lowe. So some results. We took 50 healthy blood donors in Belgium and uh, also 84 CFS and ME patients. We uh, coded these samples and sent them to Judy. And the results came back when we opened the code. We saw that 14% of the healthy blood donors was positive versus 84 of the ME CFS patients where 57% was positive. This is very significant. When we then look at uh, the patients who had had a blood transfusion prior to disease, 61% was positive with different techniques. We used serology, we used the co-culture technique and MLV, and we found 61% positive of these 26 patients. 14 ME patients who had donated blood after being diagnosed, we found that there was uh, still 43% uh, positive, we had six positives out of uh, 14 uh, ME CFS patients. So that means that um, the blood was not clean when it was given to other people. Then when we looked at 61 ME CFS patients from different countries in, in Europe um, and looked at different techniques measuring uh, XMRV, serology, MLV, and, and XMRV co-culture, we found that 73.6% was uh, at least positive for one of the tests. So this is in line with other findings. Uh, it's not different uh, from uh, the US findings. Now we've been looking at other things uh, in these patients and you know that there is a vitamin D receptor gene polymorphism. And we did an analysis in 185 ME CFS patients and we looked at uh, two uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, FLK1 and BSM1. Uh, because we thought that uh, we find more patients in Nordic countries than in, in, in the south of Europe. And uh, there is a difference in sunlight, as you know. Uh, and so uh, we thought there could be a genetic difference in the response to vitamin D. And so, uh, as you can see on this slide, when we start with FOK1 uh, uh, gene polymorphism, we see that uh, the high responders for uh, GCMOF, which is the macrophage activating factor uh, from uh, vitamin D binding protein, uh, we see that uh, there is significant uh, lower um, FF high responder in the, uh, the major letter FF and um, in the, in the control, it's 37% versus 24% in patients. The same for BSM-1. There's small BB is the high responder. Uh, you see that there are more uh, high percent in the control as in the patients. Uh, the controls come from uh, an international uh, European, African-American database. And uh, Africans, of course, have completely other uh, values here, but uh, th these were uh, really uh, compared to European controls. The moderate responders are, are the same, and as you see, uh, there's a spelling error, should be small ff and uh, a large bb, uh, and you see that there is also a difference in uh, response to uh, GCMOF. Uh, so there are more low responders in the ME patients when compared to um, the uh, normal population. Now, um, we've uh, also done biopsies in, in the gut in, in patients who were negative for PCR, for co-culture, for MLV, serology, but we didn't find anything. And we got an extra 10 patients out by uh, PCR uh, out of the gastric biopsy. Now, we used only three different primers, so it could be that we get out more uh, when we use more primers. And uh, so this is a study which is still uh, ongoing. 
Now, a totally other subject, because we also try to explain what is happening in, in CFS, is uh, the redox sensing. There's clearly an abnormality in the redox status of uh, CFS patients, and recently there's been a lot of attention in HIV and in cancer on what we call these um, cellular prion proteins. I mean, the PRPCs are cellular prion proteins. They have nothing to do with the prions of mad cow disease, but they are surface proteins uh, that have a number of functions. And uh, when you see this three-dimensional structure of uh, a surface uh, protein, you see that um, there are some places where metals uh, can um, really uh, change this three-dimensional structure, and that will alter the function of these proteins. So, for example, reduction of copper uh, from 2 plus to 1 plus will lead to an altered redox state, is something that is, is known, and that goes together with a change in uh, uh, conformism in the three-dimensional structure of these proteins. And so we know that the functionality of uh, PCRP is important in copper transport, and here we make the relationship with red blood cells and high copper levels in the blood. In calcium, the L-type voltage-gated channels are regulated by these proteins. The HPA axis is, is uh, related by these proteins. Neuronal pr protection is, is related to this. Also, signal transduction, and also other pumps like MRP, uh, which is important in uh, efflux of heavy metals. We know when we do testing on patients, when we give a ke a chelators, that more metals come out of the body of these uh, CVS patients than other, other, other people. So if the MRP pump uh, doesn't work properly, you pump out less metals. When we look at where the PRPs are, PRPCs are in the body and at the different tissues, we know that there's more in the brain, in the hippocampus, in the intestine, in the lymphoid cells, in the stomach, in the spleen, and in the muscles. By accident, these are all important um, uh, organs in a CFS pathophysiology. So uh, we thought that we should look at these uh, surface proteins to see if they could play a role in this disorder. So we looked at uh, PBMCs and we uh, have incubated them in an appropriate buffer in presence of a chemilometric uh, probe, which will be CLP from now. Next to this, uh, PRP redox drug is, uh, is added to stimulate reactive oxygen, and that is what really happens in, in, in CVS patients, so this is uh, going to be uh, uh, elicited, which is uh, proportional to the active state of the PRPC, and which ROS reacts with CLP to produce light. So uh, we uh, know that uh, they can be detected then in front of a photomultiplier. To an identical sample and uh, CLP, an additional trigger is added that stimulates cells to produce ROS at the maximum capacity, and that's the Lmax. And then we, the Lmax to the, the LB defines a functional index, and this functional index is now called SI, and this can be compared for different tissues and cells from controls to patient populations. It is a technique which is new, uh, is, is been patented by Chris Ruland of, of our group, and it's really a more simplified way to measure these uh, aberrant prions, as we call them, or aberrant proteins on surfaces of cells. Uh, the normal techniques that have been described in literature take a week to do. So this is a test that can be done in 20 minutes. And so they are small glycoproteins that are attached to the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane of mammalian cells, and they are, um, in fact, expressed in, in hemopoietic cells, in neuronal cells, in T and B cells, in natural killer cells, in muscle, in the intestinal tract, spleen, adrenal glands, endothelial cells, and in platelets. And PRCP binds copper and plays a role in calcium uptake. And we know that uh, some studies uh, here in England uh, from certain labs have shown that intracellular calcium is increased in these patients. So it protects cells against oxidative stress, prevents cells from apoptosis, 
interacts with viruses where it binds with GP120, is involved in neuroprotection and plays an important role in immune and angiogenetic responses. Therefore, we estimated that the hallmarks of CFS, such as oxidative stress, calcium channelopathy, T cell dysfunction, copper uptake changes, altered red blood cells, morphology, and oxygen transport, uh, coagulation and hormonal responses, uh, as well as viral entry, could be attributed to this aberrant uh, PRP function. So uh, to make it easy, um, I, I left out a few things, but uh, I show a, a curve of a normal protein under uh, luminescence, which is the green curve. So there's a normal reaction to the reaction I described. And you see what, how aberrant proteins, uh, surface glycoproteins react the PRPDX. Uh, it's, it's the yellow line. So it's easy to make the difference between uh, the uh, proteins that react uh, abnormal in luminescence and normal in luminescence. So uh, these proteins have an abnormal conformation because uh, the metals that keep their three-dimensional structure uh, are, have been changed. So we know that the, uh, this SI index is changed in, in, in CFS patients. And uh, when we compare to, com uh, to controls, uh, there is a really statistically uh, different uh, thing. The paper here is, is being written up and it's going to be submitted soon. So uh, we know that the functionality of these uh, aberrant proteins, uh, of these proteins is um, altered in CFS ME and with this uh, new technique, uh, we can uh, do some further research and also uh, do some drug testing in drug discovery and in other chronic diseases as fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, autism, and cancer, where we all find these um, aberrant proteins. When we look at the stool, um, we see a lot of abnormal things. And uh, in my idea, this has to do with uh, inappropriate food intake, uh, food intake which is not appropriate with our own genetics, and uh, also um, with uh, the fact that our immune system is altered, uh, the, the immune system of uh, CFS patients is altered. And um, when we add blastocystis, for example, there's a lot of patients that are chronically infected with blastocystis. Blastocystis is, uh, tends to shift TH1 to TH2, so it, <coughs> The cysts stay in, 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 in the gut even after treatment, and they add to the abnormal immune system. The overgrowth of pathogens, which were already discussed earlier, but I will come back, uh, is, is certainly present in most patients. Uh, giardiasis, when you have a, a TH2 a shift in your immune system, you're not going to get rid of your giardia. When your immune system is not functioning properly, your T cells are not going to function properly and so on, um, you are not going to get rid of your georgia. We even find cryptosporidium, uh, which we find in AIDS patients, we find cryptosporidium in the stool of patients. 98% of the ME CFS patients, and I'm being very prudent because I think it's 99%, we have to still calculate it, um, um, has in fact extremely low IgA levels in, in the stool, uh, which is uh, to be expected at which show that there is an abnormal uh, gut immunity. The stool anti-chemotrypsin is often elevated, which shows that there is colitis. The stool chemotrypsin is often very low, which shows that there is an exocrine pancreatic dysfunction. And some patients have occult blood loss. Well, we showed uh, in, in a paper that we did with Henry Butt uh, that there is mainly overgrowth with uh, enterococcus and streptococcus for the aerobic anaerobic. And for the purely anaerobic, uh, we see overgrowth with Prevotella and a subgroup also with Clostridium. Now, these three first, enterococcus, streptococcus, and Prevotella, are hydrogen sulfide and D lactate producing bacteria. And um, so, this is another uh, pathological finding that we can take into account. In the saliva, you can do a lot of hormonal uh, measurements, but cortisol is, is often low, as you know. Uh, we can detect IgAs for amoeba and for helicobacter, and also gliadin uh, IgAs. Urine testing, well, uh, urine testing, we uh, 
presented you two years ago with a new urine test. In the meantime, we know that it means more than just hydrogen sulfide. Uh, we know that the TH1, TH2 balance is controlled by the redox status, and uh, it's, the redox status is defined by the intracellular versus the extracellular uh, situation. And when you have a depletion of intracellular antioxidants, uh, you go towards the TH2 uh, immunity. When you get regeneration, when you, you know, in fact uh, recover uh, the antioxidants, you will go uh, towards a TH1 uh, situation. And we know that the majority uh, from a previous study, we already published this in 2002, that the majority of CFS patients has a TH2 dominated immune system. And when we uh, look at different diseases, we see that multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and Crohn's disease, and some cases of IBS are extremely TH1 dominated. Other diseases like CFS, HIV, XMR related uh, disease, autism, mercury poisoning, chemical sensitivity, allergies, and parasites should be blastocystis here as example. Well, they can induce a TH2 uh, immunity. And we know that uh, these things are controlled by the redox status. So any drugs or other things that uh, really control the redox status, TH1, TH2, uh, will in fact have an effect on uh, this system. Now, the, the test we, that was developed in 2009 uh, was really to show whether there were thiosulfates in, in urine, uh, but uh, in fact, this is also a very good test that uh, in fact gives the balance for TH1, TH2. We analyzed a massive number of first morning urine samples obtained from patients facing uh, conditions with overactive TH2, ulcerative colitis, autism, mercury poisoning, uh, chronic viral infections, uh, ME, and so on. And, and then we came to a, a, a reaction principle that uses a colorimetric substrate changing color upon reaction with metabolites uh, that and they mix the urine from going yellow, uh, being yellow to light green, uh, purple, and black. And the development of this color is time dependent and quantitative. And um, a lot of you know this test already. Uh, if you are TH1, you stay completely to the, on the left side. And in fact, uh, even after um, many hours, uh, the uh, urine stays yellow. Nothing happens. When you are neutral, when you have a balance between TH1 and TH2, your urine will start coloring after maybe half an hour, an hour. But we, the readout of the test is uh, after uh, three minutes. And so a moderate TH2, uh, you see the, the, the green-brown color and the far TH2, the, we see that uh, the color becomes completely black. And we have two studies where we did CFS ME patients, there are also controls done, but uh, just to no show the spectrum in CFS ME patients in two different uh, groups, uh, one group was 163 ME patients, we see that 75% have, uh, in fact, a shift uh, towards TH2. And in the other study where 309 patients were involved, it was even higher. It was 82% uh, that had uh, a TH2 uh, shift. So 80% of the urine samples obtained from CFSME patients produced a time-dependent quantitative change in color compared to 4% of the controls. They were perfectly healthy controls from diff different ages and sex. So the urine test principle we developed offers an easy way to determine and do the follow-up of a TH1, TH2 balance, which we think is essential in this disease, and uh, also in other diseases. And uh, we see that we can uh, follow up CFS and we can follow up treatments uh, with a relatively um, simple, in a relatively simple way. Now, the second part uh, of my speech is about the therapeutic strategy and novel treatment studies. Uh, the most important person in my group is a dietitian. Uh, we know that because of food, loss of food tolerance in this disease and predisposing uh, food problems, that we need to test for fructose malabsorption, lactose intolerance, gluten and glycogen intolerance, casein intolerance, 
and also very important histamine hypersensitivity because uh, mast cells and other cells in our body, also in our gut, are overactivated in this disorder. Uh, a lot of patients are very histamine uh, sensitive. So we do a number of testing and then there is intervention by the dietitian and um, she has marvelous results only uh, by uh, doing this first step. What can you do uh, to change the intestinal dysbiosis? Well, for enterococcal and um, for a streptococcal overgrowth, which is massive in some patients, you can do pulsed antibiotic therapy. And a lot of patients get worse during the treatment, but get much better immediately after the treatment. And this can be uh, adapted to the result of individual fecal uh, microbial analysis. Probiotics are also chosen based on the result of the FMA, as we call it. Uh, prebiotics uh, are given and lactoferrin. Also enzymes, because the pan pancreatic enzyme uh, production is, is lower than normal. And as 100% of our patients have gastritis, as shown by uh, biopsy in, in, the, in, in the stomach, often uh, extra hydrogen chloride is necessary to digest proteins because undigested proteins cause uh, extra problems in the gut and also on, uh, another burden on the immunity. In some patients, it is uh, necessary to remove the biofilm. There's a lot of research going on, on on biofilm now, and the reason why some treatments don't work for the gut is sometimes that some patients have massive amounts of biofilm. If the elastase activity is high, Beta-lactam uh, antibiotics are the first choice because they're also elastase inhibitors. So you get two things at the same time. As anti-inflammatory strategies, we don't use the normal oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because of the gut issues. Uh, we can use it IM if necessary. There is artusinate, curcumin, and many other options uh, that work uh, anti-inflammatory. And of course, one of the standard treatments that is used is hydro uh, hydroxycobalamin more than methylcobalamin to block uh, the uh, peroxy nitrate, the ONOO negative, which is a very strong oxidator and which is very toxic for membranes of permanent uh, cells and also for other cells. I think the work of Marty Paul is, is very well known and I'm not gonna go into this, this thing. PRCPs. Uh, well, we did some experiments, and uh, we have used DMSO uh, in one patient's IV and in, in more patients in a cream, uh, and it's very well taken up. It smells terrible, DMSO. DMSO is, in fact, a sort of, sort of a chelator. It originally was used in the car industry, and uh, it's non-toxic for humans. In the United States, there's a lot of uh, centers that use DMSO as anti-aging, and uh, so DMSO is uh, decreasing uh, the number of prions because it, uh, these uh, aberrant prions, aberrant proteins, they're not fixed as well as the normal uh, surface proteins on the cell, and so they're washed off more easily by DMSO. Um, some patients are oxygen toxic, others respond terribly good uh, uh, to oxygen, uh, and uh, so this is probably because there is a, a take-up problem in red blood cells uh, that are full of uh, PRCP, aberrant uh, P, uh, PRCPs, and uh, so the auction here works. Isoprenosine, there has been one placebo-controlled study uh, uh, a while ago in the Journal of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, and uh, I, I think it works best in patients who have a TH1, TH2 shift, a real shift, and have low serum uric acid levels. Um, about one third or more, just more of the patients are uh, responders to this isoprenosine. And then uh, I lend the slide and he, he asked me to, to show it to you. Uh, uh, Derek Enlander has done a big study now on 850 ME CFS patients. And, and uh, 850 is a large number. And uh, so he put them in four groups with placebo, with uh, cutapresin and hepapresin, and we're not allowed to use hepapresin in Europe because it's from bovine origin. Um, he used then cutapresin hepapresin complex. That means he uh, added some glutathione and a few other oxidants. And then he added uh, another uh, amount of glutathione and vitamin C 
and other uh, stuff to where you uh, have antioxidant therapy uh, to um, the treatment. And you can see he used the Karnofsky score, which we all know from zero to 100 for the quality of life. And he also used the ECOG, which is a, a, a scale, a validated scale from zero to four, where at zero, you're fully active. And um, this is like a Karnofsky score of 90 to 100, and uh, four, you're completely disabled and bedridden. And when you look at his results, then you see that the Karnofsky score is not changed in the placebo group, and that the group that gets the uh, cutapressin, hepapressin, plus the antioxidants and uh, the other supplements uh, responds very well after nine months. Um, and as I said, this is a very large group. It's like 200 people in, in each, each group. And we know that uh, cutapressin, uh, which has been on the market for 70 years in the United States, which was used originally for acne and for um, uh, herpes, uh, uh, herpes type, type 1 and type 2, and uh, that this uh, is really a redox shifter and, and, and shifts TH2 to, to TH1, and that's the reason why, why I'm using it, because uh, I think it's one of the cardinal uh, problems in this disease. Then we come to the compassionate use of GCMOF. We had 108 ME-CFS patients that um, were all either MLV or XMLV positive serology or in culture. And we gave him 100 nanogram in one ML physiological serum, GCMOF, IV or subcutaneously once a week. Most patients in this first 180 were IV. And the doses was a little bit adapted uh, from patient to patient. Um, most got 100 nanograms, but because of side effects of headaches and sleep problems, uh, in some, we had to reduce the dose. The duration of the treatment was five to 40 weeks. In fact, this compassionate use is gonna be followed by um, a double-blind uh, placebo-controlled trial in, in uh, part of a bigger trial. And the outcome of preliminary data, which we just, uh, in fact, uh, analyzed a few days ago, is that uh, it's self-reporting on seven symptoms, fatigue, sleep, pain, neurocognitive recovery, orthostatic intolerance and digestive problems, um, a majority of the responders all got a uh, significantly uh, decreased number in these uh, uh, symptoms. And we only took uh, people as responders if two or more of these symptoms had changed. And uh, it was certainly the fatigue and recovery that was faster uh, in, in this group. Now, uh, patients with um, Chronic fatigue syndrome have all sort of viruses that uh, reactivate, and uh, maybe uh, XMRV is also playing there a role, and they produce more nagalase. And nagalase uh, is, uh, in fact, uh, toxic, as I can say it, to uh, the, the GC, because uh, it changes the uh, GC, so it cannot be transformed in, anymore in GCMOF. So there's a, a decreased activation of macrophages uh, when you have persistent viral infection, or when you have uh, continuous viral activation, as you see in these people with uh, a shifted immune system towards DH2. So um, this uh, is enough for an ethics committee to, to do, in fact, a, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Uh, to, um, and we will uh, add some things to it uh, because uh, uh, we think that uh, this is not sufficient uh, as a trial. Other things I use less frequently, and I don't use amplers anymore. I mean, I had an uh, agreement from the ethics committee and from the Belgian government for nine years, and that ended in 2002. So we're uh, restricted to Valside, Valtrex, and Aciclovir in selected patients with uh, very high <coughs> levels of HV6 and EBV. We measure those in quantitatively in the gut. That means we have now viral load in the gut per million cells, per million uh, stomach cells, uh, we can have uh, results in HV6 and EBV, and uh, some people have like 100,000 or 200,000 copies of EBV per, or HV6 per million cells. Also, um, we have not this done this for enterovirus because there are too many, many types, uh, but 
uh, we have a small group with uh, parvovirus, and uh, these people have only IgG for parvos, like all we all have uh, IgGs for parvo, uh, but in some subgroups we find, and I think we have 12 now, uh, of, of these patients have very high loads of uh, parvo uh, B19, and these can, as you heard earlier, treat it very well with IV gamma globulins. And then there is a, a, a group where we think that the zoonosis, the persistent zoonosis, play an important role in, in the disorder. And there we use, in fact, the ELATS protocol, uh, international protocol, uh, which is international standardized. And, and for each of the zoonosis, Rickettsia, Borrelia, Bartonella, there is a specific uh, protocol. You can find that on the internet if you're uh, interested. Uh, so we adapt that, uh, as we say in French, à la tête du client. So the contributors to this presentation were, of course, Derek Endlander, who lent me his slides. Um, and I, I want to show you this because I use a lot of cutoprisin uh, as a redox uh, shift modifier. Marc Fremont, who is a bioengineer, uh, who is an expert on PCR and on culture. And Chris Luland, who is a chemist, he has, I think, 20 patents uh, on his name, all on um, luminescence and on chemical changes in uh, bodily fluids. Thank you. <laughs>